right, well, today we are going to be kicking off and starting a brand new sermon series called The Way of Jesus as we talk about what it means to be with Jesus and to become like Jesus. And that is something that we are all called to do, is to be with Jesus and to become like Jesus and to live life as Jesus lived a life. And I just want to say, as I was preparing this week for this uh, message, uh, it, it was tough. It really was convicting. It was probably the most I've been beat up as I've been studying. And um, these are just some truths that God's been doing in my heart here recently and, and things that he's been working on me about. And, and I believe that are things that are needful for all of us as his followers. And so this week, we're going to kick off the series talking about what it means to follow Jesus. And so this is going to be kind of an introductory message to this series that we're going to be in over the next several weeks and what that's going to look like. Uh, and so there's a lot of information. I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can. Uh, I, normally, I normally don't write out a lot of my, my sermon. Most of the time, I just have points to kind of keep me on track. But there's so much information. I'm, I, as I was studying this week, I'm just going to do my best to uh, to get through all of it without overwhelming us, but um, I really think there's so much as we study Scripture and when we talk about what it means to follow Jesus that that is so important for us to realize uh, that is there and what God is calling us to. So uh, I want to ask a question as we get started. How many of us here today, we're familiar with uh, the words that are spoken when we baptize a new believer in Christ. When we baptize someone and we say these words, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we say these words, buried in the likeness of his death. And then we say, raised to walk in the newness of life. Most of us who have experienced our own baptism, or we've seen the baptism of, of other people, we've heard these words spoken, that when someone follows Jesus in obedience to him and is baptized, that we say, buried with him in the likeness of his death, and then raised to walk in the newness of life. Those words, walk in, raised to walk in the newness of life, have a very deep meaning when we think about what that means. But sadly, those words many times now have gotten to the point of just being words and phrases that are part of a ritual. Those words are intended to communicate something that has sadly been forgotten by so much of, the America, of American Christianity. And so, sadly, these words that are supposed to be so deep in meaning have gotten to the point where they just are phrases and words we say as part of a ritual. And so I want to ask a, couple, a few questions as we get started for us to, to meditate on throughout this message and for us to meditate on throughout the week. And so here's the first question I have to ask. Do we believe that following Jesus is more than just asking him into our hearts to save us? Do we believe that it's more than that? Do we believe our goal should be bigger than just showing others how to kneel, pray a prayer, and make a decision? Do we believe that our goal should be much larger than that? What if how we've learned to think about our life as a Christian has contributed to an environment that feels more like empty, unfulfilling religious rituals? And then what if this mindset has created stagnant churches that don't look like Jesus, act like Jesus, or have an impact like Jesus? And so that's the, the four things I want us to, to ponder on and to ask ourselves as we begin this journey looking at the way of Jesus and what it means to be with him and to be like him. And so we're going to start off today in one particular verse in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, so often when we hear that verse of Scripture, we misread this as a statement about who's in and who's out, 
who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. So often that's how we probably heard that verse preached, that Jesus is the only way and apart from him there is no other way. And so if you don't come through Jesus, then you can't, you cannot come to the Father. And we look at it as that it's just who's in and who's out. When in reality, this verse is so much deeper than that. Following Jesus is more than just having a home in heaven when we die. And I'm afraid that in American Christianity, we have reduced following Jesus to get out of hell free card. And we've reduced following Jesus to raise your hand, pray a prayer, make a decision, and hey, you're good to go. And when in reality, that concept is nowhere ever found in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus doesn't call converts to Christianity. He calls people to apprentice, to be his disciple, to learn from him, to follow him. And in biblical times, being an apprentice of a rabbi was a big deal. In fact, rabbis had their choice of who their students would be. And in fact, if you study much about this, and I did a little bit this week, this was really interesting because you couldn't just go up to a rabbi and say, hey, I want to follow you and I want to learn from you and I want to be your student. No, they got to choose you. And it was up to them who they chose as their students and their disciples and their apprentices. But when someone was chosen by a rabbi to apprentice under them, they left their entire way of life. They dropped what they were doing, and they immediately took off to follow after the rabbi, to walk in the dust of, of his steps, to live with him 24-7, to sit at his feet, to eat meals with him, to learn the way he interpreted the, the scriptures, to learn his mannerisms and his way of life. And so when we think about that, John 14, 6 has on, takes on a whole new meaning. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so let's, dip, let's dive into that just a little bit. It's more likely that what Jesus was saying is this, that the marriage of his truth, his teaching, and his way of life, his lifestyle, is how to get to this with God life that he offers to whosoever will. And so... I love how author Eugene Peterson and pastor said this. He said it this way, the Jesus way wedded to the Jesus truth brings about the Jesus life. I love how he says that. In fact, he goes on to say that Jesus as the truth gets far more attention than Jesus as the way. Jesus as the way is the most frequently evaded metaphor among the Christians with whom I have worked for 50 years as a North American pastor. And let's just be real today. We focus way more on Jesus as the truth, probably, than we do Jesus as the way. It's really easy for us to intellectually accept and agree that Jesus is truth, that, that he is the truth. And it's really easy for us to even incorporate that into our lives as far as a belief in that. But it's another thing to completely reorient our life to the extent that we follow the way of Jesus. And so throughout the book of Acts, we see new followers identified by a specific pattern. And it's this, they hear the truth of the gospel, they believe it, they get baptized, and then they begin to shape their lives around a different way of life. They began to live in a way that was so different than the lives they used to live, a life so different from the culture around them that they were easily identifiable. They didn't dress or talk weird. They, they didn't isolate themselves into monasteries or cut themselves off from family and friends. But in fact, what they did is they lived their lives with such different priorities, such different attitudes and different lifestyles that they were labeled what was called followers of the way. And we see that in Acts chapter 9, verse 2, chapter 19, verse 9, chapter 24, verse 22. They were called, we see they were referred to as followers of the way. But how did they live? What made them different after deciding to follow Jesus? What was it exactly that set them apart? Well, it was this. They understood that Jesus came to show us 
what living was always supposed to be. They understood that Jesus came to show us what life is supposed to be and what God intended for it to be. They saw in Jesus a different kind of life. They saw in Jesus an abundant life for those who would follow him. And in fact, Jesus even says that in the Gospels, that he says, I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So Jesus is not just interested in where we spend eternity, but Jesus is also interested in how we live in this moment and in this life and how we live and follow the way. And so what does it mean that Jesus showed us the kind of life he wants us to live. So what what does that mean? What does that look like? So in order for us to really understand what that's all about and what it means to follow Jesus and to walk in newness of life, there's going to be some things I want to share today that I think are very important for us to understand when we ask the question, what does it mean to follow Jesus and what does it mean to walk in newness of life? And so let's jump into this today and let's talk about these things. Number one, the first thing that we have to understand is that we were created to have a relationship with God. We were created to have a relationship with God. In fact, as we read through the first book of Scripture, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, we can see that we were made and created to have fellowship with God. God created man so that he would dwell in the garden, and it was God's intent that we would dwell in the garden, and that we would live the life that that he had created us to live, and that we would experience this life, and that we would have a relationship with him. And think about Adam and Eve. Adam, in fact, had a one-on-one relationship with God. He knew God in ways that we don't. He experienced the presence of God in ways that we We haven't experienced yet. And so we have to understand that that's how God wired us and God created us to have this relationship with him. And so our relationship with God, it's going to rightly order every other relationship that we have in our life. And as Adam and Eve communed with their creator, they were living as he designed them to live. They were doing the work that he gave them to do and they were in a place of of peace and a place of purpose in their lives. And so they were created for this. And in fact, we all have been created and wired to have a relationship with God. Uh, some, there are some people, they, they talk about that there's this, uh, there's this longing and this desire that God has put in us to have this relationship with him. And and we're going to talk about this here in just a few more moments that we fill that longing with all sorts of things uh, as a a way to try to fill that, that void that we have because we have not experienced that relationship with God. But we're created to have that. That's the first thing. We've been created to have a relationship with God. And here's the second thing, and we're going to spend a little bit of time in this. Because this is really important for us to see this as a foundational part of what it means to follow Jesus. And here's the second thing. Number two, sin causes us to look for fulfillment in life outside of a relationship with God. Sin causes us to look for fulfillment in life outside of a relationship with God. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God had in the middle of the garden, he told Adam and Eve, he said, he told Adam, he said, you can freely eat of any tree in this garden. All the trees that were made, like there was no tree in the garden that was off limits to Adam except for one tree. And God says it's this tree, the good of knowledge, the uh, the tree of the good of knowledge and evil. And he says, Adam, you need of any tree, but the day you eat of this tree, you are surely going to die. It's going to bring about death. And so we see that this tree of knowledge of good and evil, it was not made for Adam and Eve. It was the only tree in the garden that they could not eat from. It was not for them. And this tree is there to serve as a reminder for you and me that we are not God and we should never try to be. 
Because in fact, that was one of the things that Satan used to tempt Eve. He said, did God really say? Well, Eve, God, re-, and I'm paraphrasing. He basically was saying, God, uh, God uh, Eve, I'm sorry, Satan said to Eve, God knows that in the day that you guys eat of this, your eyes are going to be opened and you're going to be just like God. Well, that was a half truth. It was true that their eyes were going to be opened when they partook of that tree. Their eyes were opened because then they found out they were naked and they realized what they had done. But the the part that Satan told them that sounded appealing to Eve was, you will be just like God. And so that sounded tempting to her. And so it should serve as a reminder for us that we're not God and we should not try to be. And in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we see a representation for all things in our own lives that are not for us. They won't help us. And in fact, they will only bring harm to us. See, we have the choice, but to choose these things that are not for us, that won't help us, that will only bring harm to us, to choose these things literally is us choosing destruction. To choose disintegration, to choose death. And so scripture paints this picture after Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it paints this picture over and over again throughout time in history of us choosing sin and self, trying to find ways to bring happiness and fulfillment in our life. Ever since the garden, time and time again, We make choices because of sin and self, choosing those, trying to find a way to find fulfillment in life. See, in our culture, we don't just have a tree in our garden. We now are in a garden surrounded by trees that bring death. It's not just a tree, but we are in a garden now surrounded by trees that bring death, things that are not meant for us because they will bring destruction, they will bring disintegration, and they will bring death to us. And so let's define some terms. Let's talk about what exactly is sin when we we talk about sin. The New Testament, in fact, makes this connection between sin and, and what we call the flesh. And in fact, you'll hear people say that a lot in, in church culture. They say, well, I just got in the flesh. Well, we never have gotten out of it. We're always in the flesh. It's always there. And in fact, the flesh is constantly warring with the Spirit of God that He has placed within us when we, we came to faith in Christ. But the flesh is that part of us that focuses on self and finding satisfaction apart from God. That's what the flesh is. It, the flesh is what drives us to focus on us, and to try to look for ways to satisfy that longing apart from God. See, what we are doing is we're trying to find fulfillment in life, but not in a relationship with God. But in running to that tree that we talked about, that tree that's in our hearts and lives, <clears throat> excuse me, back up and say that again, but we're, what it is, we're trying to find fulfillment in life, but not in a relationship with God, but rather in running to that tree in our hearts and our lives, finding satisfaction and fulfillment apart from God by disobeying the instructions that he gave us. And so we could say sin is simply this. People will say it's missing the mark uh, as far as if you define the, the Greek word. It's kind of like an archery term. But sin is literally anything that we think, say, or do that goes against what God wants for us. And so scripture tells us that Often, the flesh is, is related to, to sin, and the flesh is what drives us to our selfish desires that are looking for fulfillment in anything apart from a relationship with God. But our flesh is that part of us that's broken by sin and can only find satisfaction in the wrong places. The flesh is, is why we, we lose our tempers. It's why we speak inappropriately to our neighbors. It's why we blame others for our problems. Our sin nature is what causes you and me to lust after people who we aren't married to. It's what causes us to overeat, to get drunk, to abuse medication, to be envious and jealous of people we should be happy for. 
It's why we're lazy. It's why we're angry. It's why we're prideful. We're lustful. We're jealous. We're unfaithful. We're materialistic or consumed with anxiety or lack of control. Those are things that, that come out of our flesh. We do all of these things. Why? Because we're in search of something that God gave us a desire for. We're in search of something that God gave us a desire for, an abundant life. And God wired us that way. He created us and wired us to live an abundant life. Now, that doesn't mean that that we're going to experience financial prosperity and like we're going to live our best life now and everything's going to be great and we're never going to struggle. We're never going to have sorrow or pain or thing. That's not what that's talking about. But Jesus is saying that we've been wired and created to live this abundant life and we find that in him. And he's saying that that longing, that longing that we have is because we're searching for something that God gave us a desire for and we're trying to fill it with all of the wrong things. But what we've done is we've turned to created things, looking for them to satisfy the longing of our hearts that were made for the worship of God and having friendship with God himself. We long for that, but we've turned to things that have been created that can never fill that place. And let's be real today, guys. We all feel that longing. I would even venture to say that those of us in this room right now, that we say we know that we are followers of Jesus. We know we have repented of our sins. We've placed our faith and trust in in Jesus. And we have surrendered our life to him to follow him. I have a feeling that we could all agree that we somehow still feel that longing because we're not following in the way that Jesus has laid out for us to follow. When we look at the world, we know there's something wrong with the world. When we look at the world, we know it's broken. We know something isn't right. We don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. God has wired us in such a way that that the Spirit of God bears witness that when we look at the world around us, we know something's not right and something is broken. We know that. We see it. And apart from God... What happens is we chase all these other things looking for that satisfaction. And so if you're in this room today and you, you, you're not a follower of Jesus, you're, you've not made that commitment and you've not surrendered your life to follow him, there's something even within you in this moment that is bearing witness to that saying, there's, there's got to be more to it than this. I remember watching a, a clip years ago after Tom Brady had won his third Super Bowl. Tom Brady has won more Super Bowls than any quarterback in in history. And they interviewed him on 60 Minutes, and and they were talking to him about it. And he said, you know, after the third one, he was talking about how he felt. And he said, I was just thinking, God, there's got to be more to it than this, right? This can't be all there is. Even something within him in that moment was saying, I've won three Super Bowls, but yet I'm not satisfied. I still have this longing. I don't have fulfillment. There's got to be more than this, right? There's something within us that bears witness, that testifies to the truth of Scripture that we will never find satisfaction. We will never find true fulfillment in this life apart from surrendering our lives, not praying a prayer, not making a decision, not walking an aisle, but surrendering our hearts and our lives to follow Jesus and to follow his way. And I'm afraid that that's why in the Christian circles in America, we're so unfulfilled in our Christian life. Why? Because we're, we're not following the way. Maybe we prayed a prayer. We, we made a decision, but we're not following the way. <clears throat> the older I've gotten, I've come to realize that, yes, we, we do make a decision when we, we choose Christ, and I know that there's huge theological debates, whether you're, you're Calvinist or you're Arminian, you're Reformed or you're not Reformed or whatever and what that means, but yes, God is sovereign. God pursues us, and we respond to that, but we have to respond. And so here, here's what I know, that, <clears throat> that yes, we have to, to respond, but 
I think so many of us, we, we responded and then we just kind of quit. And we're not following. But we're never going to find fulfillment. We're never going to find satisfaction apart from following the way of Jesus. And so we're going to talk more about that over the coming weeks, what that looks like to walk in the way, to live in the way. But let me give you the third thing. Number three, when we think about what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to walk in newness of life. Number three, Jesus manifests fullness of life, life as it was always meant to be lived. Jesus manifests fullness of life, life as it was always meant to be lived. See, Jesus enters into a world whose relationship with God has been broken by sin. He came to a world of people who don't even know what to do about it. And many of them are so far from a relationship with God, they don't even know there's a different kind of life that God created them to live. Jesus came into a world where people, they didn't even know what to do about it, and they were so far from a relationship with God, they didn't even know that a different kind of life existed or was available. So let's look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and we're going to stay here for the remainder of our time in the next little bit. I want to read Sean chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Listen to the words of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the li- that light shines in the darkness. And yet the darkness did not overcome it. So that word life in verse number four, we just read that it says in him was life. And that life was the light of men. That word life in verse four is translated from the Greek word zoe. It's not just simply referring to physical life. But rather, that Greek word zoe carries the meaning of the absolute fullness of life. Not just having physical life, because we already have physical life, but Jesus, it says, in him was life. Not just physical life, but in him was the absolute fullness of life in the person of Jesus. It also includes this idea of the logos, a Greek word that's translated word, when it says, in the beginning was the word, was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. And so that word, logos, is a Greek word, as we said, translated in English to mean word, which means this, the divine reason implicit in the cosmos, ordering it and driving its form and meaning. So in John's gospel, Jesus is identified as the Word or the Logos. <clears throat> and so, in Him, we see life as God created it to be. In the person of Jesus, we see, God, uh, see life as God created it to be, unbroken, untarnished by sin, and life in its fullness. In Him, we see the way we were always supposed to live the way we were always supposed to work, the way we were always supposed to find our purpose. And Jesus, we see humanity in its perfection. Think about this. Jesus never worried about tomorrow. He never damaged his friendships with harmful words. He didn't lose his cool. He didn't waste his time living I'm sorry, he didn't waste his time. He didn't live with crippling anxiety about the future. He didn't chase money or material possessions. Jesus lived the full life, the abundant life. Jesus lived the life that you and I were always created to live and meant to live. And so it's vital for us to understand that Jesus was a real human being. This is one of those things they call it the hypostatic union. It's, it's a big fancy word that basically means Jesus was 100% God and he was 100% man. Now, 
we start thinking about that, it's going to blow our minds. You're going to like, and it's going to make your mind hurt if you really start trying to think about that too long. Because we can't comprehend that. So when we hear 100% God and 100% man, we think, well, how could that be? There are moments in Jesus' life where we see his humanity come through and we see his, his struggle with temptation. And we see him being tempted in the wilderness and his weakness. And we see his humanity. And there's moments that we see his divinity when we see him expressing that. But yet, Jesus was a real human being. And so one of the things that's important for us to understand when we think about that is Jesus did not live the way that he lived because he was God. Now, follow me for just a moment. He lived that way because it's how he created humans to live. And so Jesus lived the way that he lived because in his humanity, he submitted his life to the will of the Father. Jesus constantly said, not my will, but your will. In fact, when he's in the garden praying, I believe we see, we see the divine and the human side of Jesus colliding. When Jesus is praying and, and sweat starts coming as great drops of blood, and he says, Father, if there be any way to let this cup pass from me. He says, but not my will be done, but your will be done. And so Jesus knew there was no other way. And Jesus wasn't trying to get out of going to the cross. But in his humanity, Jesus was suffering. And in his humanity, he's saying, Father, if, if there is some other way. But his divinity knew there was the way. But he submitted his life to the will of the Father, and he submitted his life to the control of the Holy Spirit. And so what that means for us is, that's good news. It means that it is possible for you and I to live in the way of Jesus. It's possible for us to walk in the way of Jesus. It, it doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect <clears throat> because he's the only perfect human being. But what it means is that as we submit our lives to the will of the Father and we are empowered, we have the same Holy Spirit living in us. In fact, when Jesus says, and when I go away, he says, I'm going to send another, a comforter, one of the same kind. I'm going to send someone who's just like me, and he's going to be with you, <clears throat> and he's going to never leave you, and he's going to guide you into all truth. And Jesus even says that you're going to do greater works, tells the disciples, you're going to do greater works than what you've seen me do. Why? Because you have the Spirit of God living within you. And he's saying, because of that, we have the ability to live the kind of life that Jesus is calling us to live doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. We're not perfect. And so don't ever get the idea from this that we're trying to say that we can somehow be perfect and live in perfection as Jesus did. And that's not possible. But it is possible for us to experience the kind of life that Jesus came to this world to live as an example for you and I to walk in. And when as we walk in that way, we find fulfillment and we find satisfaction. Doesn't mean the way is easy. In fact, the way is hard. The way goes against everything in our flesh. Our flesh says, no, that sounds crazy. You're going to do what? But as we follow Jesus and walk in the way, we find fulfillment and we find satisfaction. And so let's wrap this up today as we get ready to close out. If you're a true follower of Jesus in this room today... You and I, we still have the flesh, and we have that sinful nature inside of us. And as we said, those two natures are constantly doing this. And so the one we feed the most is the one that's going to win out. But we still desire the wrong things. It's because it's, it's all we've naturally known. It's what we do. It's who we are. It's what comes natural to our flesh. We've look to these created things to bring us satisfaction. And so it's a daily battle of surrendering those things and laying them at Jesus' feet saying, Lord, I, I sacrifice this and I surrender this to you because I'm looking to this to find fulfillment. You know, we look to relationships for fulfill, fulfillment. We look to careers for fulfillment. We look to sometimes money 
and possessions, drugs, alcohol, fill in the blank. We look to all these things. Sometimes it's food. But we look to everything that has been created and we try to find fulfillment in those things that will never ever bring fulfillment. But within us is another force. We have the spirit of the living God inside of us. We have a spirit that empowers us to live a different kind of life. These early followers of Jesus that we talked about just a few moments ago in the book of Acts, the ones that we said were followers of the way. In fact, you don't ever see the term Christianity anywhere in the New Testament. But what you see is the way. And that's how they were referred to. They were followers of the way. What was the way? It was the way of Jesus, the life of Jesus. These earlier follow, early followers of Jesus, they adopted the practices and lifestyles of Jesus and they yielded to the Spirit of God within them. They weren't perfect. Far from it. In fact, if you read the New Testament, you find that out very quickly. But there was something different about them from the people around them. And even from the life they had previously lived. They weren't perfect. But there was something different. And why was it different? It was because they followed the way of Jesus. And so I just want to say as we, we close out this morning and we get ready to sing. I want us to examine our, our, our profession of, of faith. Not to cast doubts upon whether we're truly a believer or not. But I want us to examine our profession of faith as we enter into this series. Because this is going to be something we're going to be talking about probably throughout the whole year. No matter what series we're preaching through. But to examine our faith. And ask ourselves, are we really walking in the way of Jesus? Are, are we living into that relationship that we've been created to live into? Are we realizing that sin has caused us to look for fulfillment in all these other things? And then, are we looking to Jesus as our example of what life is supposed to look like? Because as I read through the Gospels, like there's just something within me that convicts me. That yes, I, I've made a profession of faith and I, I know I'm a... I'm a follower of Jesus, but there's something within me that I read these things about Jesus' life and I'm like, and I'm not really doing so well with that part of it. I need, I need, to, I need to ask Jesus to empower me to have strength in that area. Maybe I'm, I'm struggling because I'm still trying to find fulfillment. And I believe we all struggle with that. We look to things to fulfill. Even in, we may be believers, but we're still trying to find fulfillment outside of that walk with Jesus. And so I really want us to examine our hearts today as we move forward into this year. I don't know what it is we've been looking to for fulfillment. But as I look at the American church, and, and, and I, I say this not as someone who's looking down like in superiority, but someone who's reading scripture and thinking, man, we're missing it. We're way off the path. I'm looking at the American church thinking, it's no wonder like our walk with Jesus feels so dead and feels so dry. Why? Because we're not spending time with him. We're not trying to walk in the path of Jesus. We're not trying to follow our rabbi and walk in the dust of his feet. We're not trying to learn from him. We're not trying to, to live the life that he lived. And I think it's why so much of our, our own Christianity is so empty and feels so ritualistic is because we go through the motions Came to church today, check. Sang today, check. Gave in the offering, check. Instead of realizing that this is it's a, completely reor a complete reorienting of our lives, lives around following this man, following God himself in this life that he has called us to follow in. And it's a daily thing. And we're going to fall and we're going to stumble along the way. But when we do, we get up and we keep walking and we keep following after Jesus and we keep pursuing Jesus. And the more I read after things like that and the more I try to implement that in my heart, I find that 
I begin to rediscover that fulfillment that God created me to, to experience and to long for. And it's only found in that. And so today, as we stand and sing, I just pray that we're going to evaluate our own hearts and we're going to evaluate our own walk with Jesus. And that we're going to say, Lord, help me to get in your word and help me to live in that and really discover what it looks like to follow Christ, what it looks like to be with him, to be like him, and to walk in his way. Let's all stand as we sing together.